Without much further ado, on behalf of the National Park Service, the Gettysburg National Military Park, and the American people, I'd like to welcome you folks to said park and specifically to the 3 o'clock Devil's Den program. My name is Scott Adrian. Obviously, I'm a park ranger. I'm wearing my green green, my pickle suit, including my Stetson. And I'm very, very proud of this piece of uniform equipment because when I put it on in the morning and I look in the mirror, it reminds me very much of Kevin Costner in the Field of Dreams. <laughs> Bill will come, wear the hat, and I'll show it. It doesn't make any difference where I am. I could be. Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines a crucible as a severe searching trial. That's one definition. Dr. Ha uh, Harry Fons, who was the head historian here for about 20 years, wrote a series of books on the battle, and uh, he stopped with day three because he was pretty much burned out and was ready to retire and decided not to do it. But he wrote a book, uh, it's called The Second Day, and it talks about specifically about the fighting on this end of the field. And he refers to this fighting as the Union Line Ablaze. And that's a very good description. It's what we Rangers refer to as the en enchilon attack, where the Confederates, brigade after brigade, division after division of the infantry are gonna assault the federal positions from the left all the way around to the right, trying to drive the Federals off the field and take the high ground. And what Devil's Den represents is the part one of that crucible. This is where the match was struck to start that conflagration. Another de definition of a crucible you may find in a dictionary is a metal or other refractory uh, material employed for heating substances to a high temperature. That's another apt description of what happened here. As we we're going to discover in our walk, this place surely contained pure, unadulterated, hellish conflict and confusion that endures for a grand total of over six hours, resulting in 16,000 casualties. This is the bloodiest part of the battle. We talked about, we already mentioned about not drinking the water out of Blum Run. This was the main water supply for both the Confederates and the Federals down here up until the battle, this part of the battle commenced. Within a half an hour to an hour, that creek was running absolutely red with blood. And the water was totally undrinkable. That's how tenacious, that's how terrible this fighting was. 16,000 casualties. We break up these programs for you folks into the wheat field, into day two, into Little Round Top, into Devil's Den because try to make it easier for us to interpret it for you and for you to grasp what happened here. Now I'm going to talk about the beginning of it, but you have to remember that after this, or towards the end of the fighting here, is when all hell breaks loose. And there's things going on a little round top, there's things going on in the wheat field, there's things going on in the peach orchard. And at the end of six hours, the wheat, wheat field has changed hands six times. And as the sun sinks over the horizon, over, the, over South Mountain over there, folks, the only victor in the wheat field is the pigs. It's a no man's land and 16,000 casualties. Well, to get started, does everybody have a pretty much a pretty good grasp of what's happened up till this point in time? Now we're going to talk about, let's say, around noon time on day two. Everybody understand basically why the armies are here, what happened on day one. Well, I already was well, I was cracking wise with my volunteer friend about Marcellus Jones, 
uh, and firing the first shot and missing, but that's all taken, that's all taken place. The, Confederal, the Federals have retreated to the high ground south of Gettysburg, and they are starting to form their fish hook. And the end of the fish hook is to be right here across from where we're standing on the round tops. And Dan Sickles, the only non-West Point graduate that is in command of a corps of the Union Army, has been given orders to occupy this ground. But he doesn't like those particular orders. He's very concerned about the rocks here and the high ground here and a little bit further around at Sherpy's Peach Orchard. And he feels this eminence is going to control access to the Emmitsburg Road, which is what the federal, most of the federal troops had come up on day, two, on day one. The First Corps, the Eleventh Corps, the Third Corps have all come up on the Emmitsburg Road. We don't want to turn that over to the enemy. And he tries to convince everybody that he's right. And General Meade is ignoring him. He's thinking offensively. Just do what I tell you to do and don't give me a bunch of flack. But, but uh, Sickles is very concerned about this. And finally, without orders, he moves his 9,000 men and his third corps approximately a quarter of a mile further west than Meade wanted it. The only problem with that is that he said he didn't have enough men to cover the ground he was assigned to, had even less to cover what he takes up, and his wings are hanging in the air, and the Confederates jump on his back. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that, about that in the program. So what we're doing is when we're standing here is we are standing at the foot of Devil's Den. And where that name comes from, there's several different stories, but one of the uh, most popular local legends I have found in my time here has been that uh, in the early days of Adams County, when it first uh, seceded from York County and was established on its own around 1800, the locals here found a big black snake, about a six footer, that was living in those rocks. And using the biblical tradition they referred to him as the devil. And of course, the devil was in his den. And that's one of the, that's one of the backgrounds of where the term comes from. And what we're gonna do now, as I said, I'm gonna do a little bit, this is a little bit different than most people do. What I'd like to do is take you across Plum Run over to the area known as the Slaughter Pen. And uh, when we get over there, you'll understand why I'm, gonna, why I'm taking you there. Brought you back here, folks, for a simple reason. I'd like to point out the rocks that are covered by the brush. Now, back in 1863, those rocks would have been pretty bare. The local farmers in here used open range technique, farming techniques, using stone fences that would uh, block their animals in. And then they would just let their animals roam and forage through this area, and they would keep the, fo the, the foliage cut down. You can see the path going through off to our left. That is the slopes of Big Round Top. And of course, on the other side are the rocks of the Devil's Den. And when the Confederates are gonna be coming to attack Little Round Top behind you, this is the natural path they have to follow. It's narrow, it's rocky, it's constricted, and you got Yankees on your, on your flank taking pot shots at you, which weren't supposed to be here. And you're hot, and you're tired, and you have very little of any water. Imagine yourself, one of those boys from Texas, or Alabama, or Georgia, that's gonna be making this march. And he's wearing a wool uniform, carrying anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds of gear on his back, a 10 pound musket, and 60 rounds of ammunition. So I just wanted to point this out to you, so because you really can't see it from the road. 
and the grow overgrowth has really hidden things. What we here in the park need is we need a battalion of volunteer goats <laughs> to come kind of eat this stuff down. And apparently about three or four years, about four or five years before I started here, uh, the park tried that and it didn't work too well because goats and visitors don't mix apparently too well. The goats kept on butting kids. And so, and um, the kids wouldn't leave the goats alone. So uh, we had to get rid of the goats. But I still think it's a good idea. Picture of uh, Dan Sickles, commander of the Federal Third Corps. And about uh, noontime, he's gonna go ahead and make a decision uh, to move his line, his 9,000 men, about a quarter mile further to the west than General Meade wanted. Now, General Hunt, who is the commander of the Federal Artillery, had come was riding the line and inspecting it uh, for the checking of how his artillery had been placed. And General Sickles, Sickles waylays him and said, Hunt, don't you think this is a, makes a great artillery platform? And Hunt says, of course it does. And he says, well, I'm going to move my, 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 my core to the over here. And Hunt says, well, wait a minute. Not on my recognition you don't. You needed to clear that with a commanding general. Well, Sickles has tried, and he just can't get Meade's attention. Needless, needless to say, there is an, pretty, some pretty bad blood between the two, two men, and some of it deserved. But anyway, that's, that's, that's getting beyond the point. So Sickles is going gonna, is gonna to move his line. And you uh, deploy his corps a quarter of a mile to the west. I took you to the, we've been to the slaughter pen. So now we're going to go ahead, go ahead and we're going to go up to the crest of the hill and then I'm going to set the table for you and then we'll get into the battle. Follow me, please. Earlier in the morning, the second, before dawn, General Lee details one of his junior engineering officers to make a scout. He wants to find the extreme left flank of the Union line. And so he sends us the engineer out with orders to find the end of the Union line. And the man does so and he reports that he got as far south as Little Round Top and could find no Yankees. Unfortunately, one of two things. Either the man was blind or he didn't go as far, he didn't get as far as he thought he did. Because on the, at this point in time, on the slopes of Little Round Top, on the other side from where we're, from the crest, there's a full division of the 12th Corps under General Geary, the whole second division of the Federal 12th Corps is encamped on the reverse slope of Little Round Top. General, General Hancock and the whole second corps, about 14,000 men, is about a mile south of here. And these men are making coffee and cooking breakfast. And in the peach orchard, there's the remains of the First Cavalry Division under John Buford. Probably close to 25, 30,000 Federals. And the engineer reports there's no Yankees here. I firmly believe the case was he didn't get as far as he thought he did. But based on this, General Lee is going to come up with a battle plan. And it's always much easier to attack the enemy on their flank rather than to try to hit them head on. So what he wants to do, he's waited until his old war horse, Pete Longstreet, and his first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia shows up from Chambersburg. And they make their march down from Hare Tavern, about three miles north of here, close to the first day's field. And they come down here and they're gonna line on Warfield Ridge. This last row of trees on the horizon is Warfield Ridge. That is a natural extension 
of Seminary Ridge, which is a little bit further to the right. And Lee's orders to Longstreet, hopefully we'll get some traffic on the road so I can point it out to you. I don't, I do not see any right now, but uh, uh, that's probably the tour route. No, yeah, no, that's it. Where the car's coming down the road to the, from the right to the left, and there's another car just went from the left, uh, right to the, the left, uh, the other way around. You can see the, it going right there. That's Amherstburg Road. To tack parallel to the Emmitsburg Road and smash into the Union left flank and roll it up like a carpet. However, as the Federals, uh, as the Confederates start coming across from Warfield Ridge, they're going to run, they run into a couple of problems. Now, the division that's been assigned to do this is John Bell Hood's division. And that comprises of four brigades, about uh, 7,400 men. He's, it's got his old Texas brigade in it, now commanded by General Roberson, or Robertson, rather, excuse me. General Laws' Alabama brigade, and then two brigades from Georgia, under General Benning, and the other under General Anderson. Like I said, about 7,400 men. And they're gonna start coming across the field, and as they come across the field, if you can see the barn uh, in the hollow there, that belongs to the Slider family at this time. And there's a detachment of the second U.S. sharpshooters in there. A company and a half, mostly Company E, the boys from Wisconsin. And these are the men that have the green uniforms. These are the men that have been trained to take advantage of terrain, and they have breech-loading weapons. They can put out 10 rounds of, uh, of 10 rounds of fire to every round that a muzzle-loading musket can. And so they start harassing the Confederates as they start coming across the field. There's not supposed to be any Yankees here, and only a fool leaves an enemy on your flank or in your rear. So instead of tacking parallel to the Emmitsburg Road, the decision has to be made to switch at 90 degrees and go perpendicular to it, which brings on the fighting in the crucible. Here, little round top, wheat field, peach orchard. The whole day to that whole left flank day two fighting. Now, General Hood is the division commander. Here's a picture of General Hood. Unfortunately, as the attack kicks off, he's taken out of action right away. There's a federal shell that explodes over his head, and the shrapnel seriously wounds him, and he winds up laying in a Confederate field hospital, having his left arm amputated. Command devolves upon the next senior man, the next, the first, the most senior brigade commander, which is going to be General Law from Alabama. In the meantime, the word can't be passed through the lines to the troops as to what's going on, so nobody knows who's really in charge. And somehow, as the elements are coming across the field, the lines get kind of mixed together. The two brigades get kind of mixed up. Some of the Alabamians. Uh, tack off with the Texans and some of the Texans and the Alabamians get mixed and they kind of split. And there's various and sundry reasons for that, uh, which you can, if you're really interested in, you can read Fonz's book and he does a very good job explaining it. But for the purposes of this program, it just say it, that it happened. And these men made this attack without much water. There had been a detail sent out uh, for water, but the word to move came before the water detail came back. And so they're making this attack and high humidity, high 80 degree weather, and wool uniforms without much water. And so they're coming, coming across, they're going to be coming across the field that way, and General Law is going to be in charge. The line is going to consist of these four brigades, and the Texas, Texans are going to be on the left flank, the Alabamians are going to be on the right flank. Now they're kind of mixed up a little bit, 
but that's probably the way it feels. Then the General Benning's going to be behind, the General Benning's the Georgians are going to be behind the Texans, and then General Anderson's troops are going to be behind the Alabamians. Maybe a couple of hundred yards separating the two brigades, the, the, the four brigades, as they come across the field. They're still being harassed by the sharpshooters as they come across the field. Now, the sharpshooters are going to fall back, fall back, fall back, and eventually wind up on top of Little Round Top. Now, we're up here at, uh, this is Captain James Smith, 4th Independent Battery of New York Artillery, Light Artillery. Uh, the guns are in the wrong spot. They were probably been at the foot of the monument in the 99th Pennsylvania. Uh, I already mentioned General Hunt, but he was here in the 1880s when they dedicated the monument for the artillery battery. And he came up to Captain, then General Hunt went up to Captain Smith and said, if you had placed your guns here on the third, 2nd of July of 1863, I would have court-martialed you for incompetence. <laughs> but they got put in the wrong spot, probably because this is where they fit. They're probably a little bit further, further, on, down, further on down in front of the infantry line, providing support for the infantry here. Now, your overall commander, and this part of the field is gonna be the division commander under General, under General Sickles, which is General Burney. It's gonna be his division that's responsible for this area. General, General Humphreys has got the wheat, has got the peach orchard. That's the second division of the third corps. But General Burney is gonna have this area, and then the brigade that's gonna be assigned to occupy the, the Devil's Den and what is known as Hawks Ridge here is gonna be General Hobart, Brigadier General Hobart Ward. And he's gonna have five or six regiments backed up by one battery of New York artillery. He's going to have the 4th Maine. He's going to have the 20th Indiana. He's going to have the 86th New York. He's going to have the 124th New York, and he's going to have the 99th Pennsylvania. Approximately 2,200 men against 7,400 to start with. Now, there's going to be in intermittent artillery fire all through the early, early afternoon. Smith's battery is dueling with Confederate batteries, and they're giving as good as they get. There's not enough room up here. Now, a battery of art Federal artillery at this time consists of six guns, divided up into three two-gun two sections, a right, a center, and a left section. There's only enough room up here on the crest for two sections. Normally when the guns are deployed, you would deploy the guns and then the caisson is going to be deployed probably about 30 or 40 yards behind it. That's the big ammunition wagon. And you're going to have enough, you're 10 men on a gun crew, you have four men up front and then the other six to what we call work the box which is the ammunition supply, and you had men constantly running back and forth between the limber, where, which is the small ammunition box, and the main caisson to resupply ammunition. At this point in time, Captain Smith has to leave his limbers and his caissons at the, on the floor of the valley behind us. So those gunners are humping up these rocks carrying ammunition in 90 degree heat wearing wool uniforms. Seemed like I'm repeating myself, but I just try to try, try to make try to make the point. So your alignment's going to be originally is going to be 99th all the way down on the right, followed by the 20th Indiana, 86th New York, 124th New York, and then here at the end of the crest is going to be the fourth main. A picture of Captain Smith.
Okay, approximately 4.15, 4.30 in the afternoon, the Texas Brigade, which is on the left flank, starts approaching the woods to our right. The Texas Brigade, the Arkansians, they're out in front, slightly ahead of the 1st Texas. And they're going to be headed towards those woods, and as they get in close to those woods, they start taking fire from the three right regiments of Ward's Brigade, the 20th, the 99th, and the 86th. They also are taking some flanking fire from the 17th Maine that's down in the wheat field, which is the other end of the woods there. And then Gerald Ward's going to order those three regiments that are giving fire to advance and drive the Arkansians back. In the meantime, the Texans come up closer. Now, the Texans are a pretty good sized regiment, almost 500 men in it. And they're going to start assaulting this spot, uh, the following, following up on the attack. And what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take you down to the triangular field where the Texas attack took place. Follow me, please. The Texans are going to be coming up this way. They're going to start b back uh, where the Emmitsburg Road is, and they're going to be coming up this way. And uh, this is a tri the wall here forms a triangle. You can see the base of it down on the other side. Smith's guns are doing what they can to support the infantry up here trying to break up these Confederate attacks. But as the, as the Rebs keep on getting closer and closer, they can't deploy, they can't depress their guns low enough to be effective. Now, for a certain period of time, they can fire a canister, which is good up to about 400 yards, to break up an infantry attack. But after that, they can't depress the guns, and so it's basically useless. So the, so the Texans do get some momentum, they're making a charge up here, and I have a quote from you from one of the uh, from one of the participants. One of the best things I think that we have is the soldiers' stories, the men that fought and served here, either in letters home, in diaries, or whatever the case may be, that we found exactly what the, what was going on. This is from Private H. Waters Berryman from Company I of the 1st Texas. He was talking about a comrade of his. I thought he'd been killed, but he jumped up and kept fighting harder than ever. I tried to persuade him to leave the field, but he would not leave. He told me if every man left for a slight wound, we would never gain a battle. So the man's been wounded, doesn't say how badly, but obviously he can still walk and he's gonna keep on coming. Some people want to call that foolish. I call it tenacious. Okay. So, while this is going on, the Texans come across the wall. They've got the fixed bayonets, and they, they can smell victory. The Yankees are right up there, and they're going to, get, going to go get them. At this point in time, this gentleman, Colonel... Van Horn Ellis of the 124th New York decides that he's going to do something about that. And those Texans are not going to take this hill. And so he has his men, his orange blossoms, as he calls them. They're called orange blossoms because every one of those men is from Orange County, New York. That's where the regiment was raised. And it was raised in early summer of 1862 of close to a thousand men. And just about a year later, they're down to less than 300. And Colonel Ellis is going to order a counterattack. And his men fix their, fix their bayonets and come pounding down the hill to plow into the Texans. and the Texans back over the wall and are chased all the way back down on the other side of the wall towards Emmitsburg Road. Go New York. Woohoo! Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, those boys from the Empire State did it. 
just at this time, things are looking pretty good for the Yankees and those two Alabama boys regiments show up, the 44th and the 48th. One of the things I forgot to mention to you is that before this happened, uh, General Ward sticks, I think I mentioned, I did mention, he sticks the 4th Main down on the rocks at Devil's Den. And the 48th is going to keep the 4th Main tied down on the rocks. And the 44th is going to come up here and they're going to slam into Colonel Ellis's left flank. And he only had 238 men to start. Now he's down to probably around maybe 175. And it's a pretty good size Alabama regiment. And things, the tide starts turning the other way. And things are starting to look again pretty bad for the Union. And so it's going back, it's going back and forth, back and forth. So now let's go see, let's go back up to, let's go back up to the crest and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get the, the first counterattack and then we'll wind up. Okay, the 44th is coming up and making things really hot for the 124th. General Ward is starting to panic. He orders the 124th, the 4th Main out of the rocks. He orders the 99th to make a bayonet charge from the right of the line down to the left. And he dispatches an aide for help to General Burney and manages to secure two extra regiments to give him a, give him a hand. The 40th New York and the 6th, uh, New, Hampshire, uh, 6th uh, New Jersey, which are down and on, on the valley floor and they're going to be engaging the uh, 48th uh, Alabama down in the slaughter pen. Smith can't fire. He's gonna hit his own men. So his men are basically standing here, ducking bullets. But Smith was a smart cookie. He says, I am probably gonna lose my guns. But if I have to abandon them, what I want you to do is make sure that you take all the implements, all the rammers, all the sponges, all the water buckets, everything you need, we need to fire these guns, plus all the friction primers. Make sure you gunners remove all friction primers so if these guns fall, those rebs can't use them against us because no one's going to bring friction primers on No infantryman's going to bring friction primers on, on, an, on a bayonet charge. So basically, that's what happens. There is a, a couple of quotes for you, folks. After the 99th is ordered to make that bayonet charge across the rear of the federal line, Corporal Peter Ayers of Company E, uh, wrote in it wrote a home the unit fired one volley and with a dash we're in the thick of the fight above the crack of the rifle the scream of shell and the cries of the wounded could be heard the shout for Pennsylvania and our homes and I think that's very very important folks these men were raised in the state of Pennsylvania in the slate fall of 1861 They've been in the Army for almost two years. Most of that time they've spent in the Army in south of the Mason-Dixon line, south of the Potomac River. And all of a sudden, for the first time, Billy Yank is defending his own. It's his turf. And these boys from Pennsylvania are fighting on their home state ground. Maybe it helps explain what happened here. For the first time ever, Billy Yank wins one. And I think fighting on his own home turf may have had a whole lot to do with that. And conversely, Johnny Reb fighting on his home turf for the previous two years may have something to do with that also. Stop and think about it, folks. Colonel Walker, the fourth Maine, before his men are pulled out of the rocks, 
I shall never forget the click that was made by the fixing of bayonets. It was if it done as one, one sound, and the whole regiment had fixed bayonets. That's how well disciplined and how well trained these men are. Ninety ninth is going to make the counter charge. You can see it. Fourth main comes up from the rocks. The guns are, are secure for a while. The crest is recaptured from the 44th. The Yankees have the high ground again for a few minutes. But then from whence we came is Gerald Benning across his knoll with 1,400 Georgians. And they absorb the remains of the Texans and the Alabamians and the Arkansians. And they, they forced the 4th Main around the, around the flank of the 4th Main. And they assault, around 515, they assault the whole federal line here. And these men have been fighting for up to almost an hour and a half. They've taken some pretty horrendous casualties, about 30%. They're running out of ammunition. And they just have just don't have much left. The right of the line starts to give first. In order, they don't panic, they don't retreat. This is where some of the fighting in the wheat field is starting to take place. Vincent has shown up a little round top. And the fighting is going on there because of the troops that had gotten through the slaughter pen. Some of those other Texas boys, the 4th, the 5th Texas, the 15th Alabama, the 47th Alabama, and the 4th Alabama that had gotten through the rocks past Devil's Den. The right pulls back thinking they've been relieved by other elements of the 3rd Corps and members of the 5th Corps and the 2nd Corps that are seeping into the wheat field. Smith abandons his guns. Again, taking his implements and his friction primers with him. He manages to get one of his four guns down the hill. The other three are captured by the enemy. A quote from a soldier of the 15th Georgia as they assault this part of the line. The 15th Georgia Regiment faced the battery. We went straight up to the top of the hill, took the guns, and met face to face the third and last time Meager's gallant Irish Brigade from New York. They fought us with desperation and tried repeatedly to recapture their battery, but we beat them back. And this shows you, as a prime example in the confusion and heat of combat, how people can make mistakes. This Georgia soldier is talking about the Irish Brigade. They were nowhere near here. They're in the wheat field. General Meager is dead at this point in time. It's just the way things sometimes go. But it shows the interest of that, how, how, the, how this uh, property was taken. Federals, like I said, have been fighting against tremendous odds for over an hour, for oh, way over an hour. When the federal line down here at Devil's Den is turned, the two relief regiments, the 6th New Jersey and the 40th New York, can't withhold off all those Confederates. And Smith's battery, even though he's got the two rear guns going and firing canister against the enemy, can't hold the line. And they have to pull back. And the Confederates take control of this part of the battlefield. And they don't lose it until they withdraw on the 4th of July. I'd like to leaving a quote, a couple of different quotes here. Captain Wigan of the 124th, he was a captain of Company A 
At this point in time, he is the senior officer in the regiment. Both Colonel Ellis and Major Horn have been killed. And he is now the senior man in the regiment. He's commanding it. And he stayed behind to make sure that he didn't leave any of his wounded behind. If there's anybody that was ambulatory, that he could make sure that he could get, that could get help, he made sure that they made their way back to the, to the federal lines. So he wasn't with the regiment when he withdrew. And when he caught up, uh, he had this, he wrote, uh, he wrote this in the uh, regimental histor uh, history that he wrote after the war. When I reached the regiment, General Ward had halted and was haranguing it. He was saying that he expected almost impossible things from his old troops, but that such a heroic, noble resistance as we had made was beyond anything he had ever dared to hope for, even from them. And to close out, folks, conclusion, everybody usually likes to know numbers. Casualties. Federal, about 829 out of about 2,500 engaged, about a 30 to 30% rate. Confederates is about a little over a little over 1,000 at about 3,500 for about 29.1% rate. The sacrifice of Ward's Brigade allows the Federals enough time to get troops to cover the round tops. There's enough time for Vincent's brigade to get there and stand off the remainder of the of Confederates from Hood's division that had made that had made it through the slaughter pen. This is part one of that crucible that we had talked about. And in conclusion, in finality, a quick quote, a, a quick poem for you. A fearful, desperate fight of life and death for freedom and union's sacred cause against all the martial flower of chivalry's proud might. Three hours they held the pass. They spiked the guns, fell back on round top, still facing the foe. And Gettysburg that saved Union fair sheds luster on those heroes banded there. Smith's New York Battery 4, one there on Devil's Den, renowned forevermore. The old 4th Maine that to the rescue came, brave orange blossoms on the scroll of fame. And golden characters are written there, the precious heritage of nobles rare. Samuel Adams Wigan, Private, 32nd Massachusetts Infantry. Thank you, folks. Questions? Anything?